Hi guys, Mike Buvaltz here with the Mike Buvaltz Bushcraft and Martial Arts channel. What I thought we could do today is head back into the woods here, uh, start a flint and steel fire, and I can give a little demo on flint and steel and my take on it, and uh, a little bit of a how-to. Um, and then heat up a campfire, make up some tea, and then we can have an after-action report and discussion about my experience at the uh, Pathfinder Pioneer Scout class. So stay tuned guys and let's head back into the woods. Okay guys, <clears throat> so we've picked out a spot here in the woods and let's have a quick little discussion about flint and steel and what you're looking for and what you want to use to make it work. Now, what they teach at the Pathfinder School is next fire mentality, uh, meaning whatever form of combustion you have for your first fire, whether it be a lighter or you've got nothing but your knife uh, and you use a bow drill fire. You want to always make char material if that option is available to you because that will then transition into being your, your method of next fire. It's a pretty constant resource. You can either use cotton or things like punk wood and the such to char and make into your char material. And all it has to do is take a spark and then it thus becomes an ember that you can blow into a bird's nest and uh, make into flame. So you're gonna need char, you're gonna need flint, quartz, or chert. It doesn't really matter. Some people like uh, particular types more. I find that it doesn't matter. And this isn't necessarily rocket science, guys. You can go out into your driveway or go to um, a crick bed and just start picking up rocks and banging them off your knife. And see, you already saw a spark fly right there. Just pick up rocks, bang them off your knife, see what throws sparks and see what doesn't. If it throws a good shower of sparks, put it in your pack and keep it. Okay, and so lastly, you're going to want carbon steel, okay? Um, this is a good reason as to why you want a carbon steel knife or some sort of carbon steel on you at all times. This is a flint striker carbon steel flint striker. It also has that little wedge in there for a bearing block for bow drill. I brought a couple of options out for you guys to look at so that you can see why it's important to have carbon steel. Now you don't need the most top dollar carbon steel knife. This is the Mora Garberg, a little bit on the higher end. It's still, it's like around 80 bucks. Still a pretty good bang for your buck when it comes to uh, <clears throat> when it comes to the quality of knife that you're getting. But again, carbon steel. Let's see if I can get it to throw here. I don't know if you can pick that up. There, some flew right there. Fumble fingers. I'm trying to look at the camera and do this at the same time, so that's kind of hard. Um, so where I was going with this is you don't need the most high-end knife. Now this is an old hickory butcher knife. $10.00 carbon steel. Let's see, I try a different rock. It too will throw sparks. See? There we go. That's what we're looking for. I hope you caught that. There. Works great. You do not need an expensive knife. You do need carbon steel. Mossy oak, stainless steel, steel uh, cheap Bowie knife. Nothing. Nothing. So, just to reiterate, guys, don't use stainless steel. If you like stainless steel knives, that's cool. I won't fault you for that. I, I prefer carbon steel, but to each their own. But if you are looking to learn flint and steel fire, at least carry some sort of carbon steel on you. This, I prefer to use this because it throws good sparks and if I can avoid damaging my knife, I will do it. Okay, so now let's talk about your char. When you make char in a fire, you're going to want some sort of container to heat up, and you're going to want to plug a little hole in it so that the gases can escape. Now, we have our three elements to fire, which is fuel, oxygen, and heat. When you're making char, you are putting fuel in a container, you are heating it up, but you are starving it of its oxygen 
so it will not combust, and it thus becomes char. Should look relatively like this. Now, not all char is created equal. Sometimes certain types of char will take sparks better than others. My favorite, I find, is when I've got a piece of char that's blackened but has almost like a shine to it. If you were to put it in a light, it has almost like a bit of a shimmer to it. I find, for me, that that picks up sparks the best. Rocks, flint, you're going to want something that's jagged. You need sharp edges. When you strike your knife or your uh, striker, whatever it may be, you're going edge to edge. You're not going to go flat to edge. You're certainly not going to go flat to flat. You won't get much results with that. Edge to edge, the sharper, the better. If you got a nice 90 degree, 90 degree spine on your knife and a nice sharp edge on your rock, one that you could almost cut with, you're going to get some pretty decent sparks off of the guy. Yeah, that one just dropped right there. So let me turn the camera back up, guys, and uh, give you a bit of a demonstration on how this is done. All right, guys. Let's talk about bird's nest construction for a second. Now, this is a nest of uh, inner aspen bark. Tulip poplar works great. Um, you will have to learn your terrain and find like the best tinder options for you. But in my area, I like aspen bark. I like tulip poplar. I like birch, but it, it, it's harder to get fibrous like these are. I mean, birch will work just fine for pretty much anything you want to do. But I prefer this stuff. Now, what I like to do is get myself a pretty good bundle that's going to be my outside bundle of more coarse material. And I'll probably make that a little bit more fine. And then I like to create this little tiny nest of the finest material. Now, I'm sitting on my shemag at the moment. And what I'm going to do is I'm just going to... And I apologize, I don't have the proper camera equipment to give you guys the best angles. So I'm working with what I got here. But I just kind of rub this together and break it apart. Just rip it up, make it real nice and fibrous. Real messy. And as I'm doing so, I got these tiny little fibers falling onto my shemag. Okay? So here, I already have a fairly fine construction. And then I'm picking up all these tiny fibers off of my shemag, the tiniest ones. And I'm going to place that in the center of my small ball. And that's not too bad. It's not Corporal's Corner good, but it's good enough to work. Now I will take this center and I'll round this out. And everything's dry so I can kind of get away with a little bit less, but and I'm going to take my small bird's nest, place it in the center of my larger nest. So now I've got materials going from completely fine to coarse on the way out. And when I ignite the char, the ember is going to go right there in the center of that char. And then I will blow it into flame. So let's do that right now, folks. All right, guys, I got my char... Uh, my char material sitting right here in the center. I'm going to use my flint striker because I prefer not to bang on my knife if I can avoid it. I like to set my char on the ground. Some people don't like to don't do that, which is fine. I don't like to knock things all over the place. Should I hit this and everything goes spilling all over? I don't know. For me, I feel like on the ground, it's just more orderly. Now, if I had a knife, I would do a, about a 12-inch strike. I learned that from Pooter Stomper, Anthony Powers over at the Pooter Stomper channel. But since I'm using my flint striker here and it's small, I'm not going to aim very well if I start up from too high. So I'm going to cut it a little bit closer, but let's give it a try, guys. And you might find that the rock you're using, if it doesn't have a very good edge, doesn't throw very good sparks, such as this one. Let's try this guy. There we go, that's better. Can you see that in there? So, 
we got a catch. Now it's on tiny ones, that's okay. Take a bigger piece, put it to the small one and blow on it. Now you're in business. Let me set this camera back up guys and then I'll watch, let you uh, watch me blow the bird's nest into fire. All right guys, so we got our bird's nest here. We've just ignited our char. Quite a few, quite a bit of it at this point. Uh, we're uh, kind of tentative to pick it up because it'll burn me, so I'll light this piece. There we go. Char in the center of the tinder nest. Tinder bundle, bird's nest, whatever you want to call it. I'm going to go ahead and take my remaining char, scoop it back up, and put it back in my can. Now, if your char is ignited and you don't want to waste all of it, that's okay. Put it in there, close it up, starve it of, a, starve it of its oxygen, and it'll just uh, it'll get rid of the ignition. All right, so we got our char here inside the bird's nest. I'm going to very, very gently kind of burrito that in there and then start lightly blowing on it. This isn't one of those things you don't want to give it all your air. You don't want to blow it out too soon. Just a little bit at a time. As you see smoke billow out from behind the bird's nest, you can start giving it more oxygen. Also, pay attention to where the wind is blowing. I can already tell by the smoke coming out of the nest that the wind is going to be blowing this way. Use that to your advantage. You want the heat to be blown towards the back of the bird's nest. Hold it up higher than your head, aim it away from you in direction of the wind, and just lightly blow. And like I said, guys, this is very dry. So this is going to, I mean, if I were to give this a good huff, it would go up in flames pretty much immediately. Turn it over on itself. <sighs> Sorry about that. I'll let her do her thing. So I'm going to build a fire here, guys, and then, uh, yeah, let's have our Pathfinder discussion. All right, guys, we got our fire going here, and um, don't need a big fire. I'm just looking to heat up some water, and I'm going to have some tea while we have this discussion. Uh, first and foremost, I really would like to get something out of the way. Joe, over at Survival Living. Thank you, buddy. Thank you for plugging my channel. It's a channel I, I don't have any, hardly any videos up, but I promise I'm going to start working on that. Uh, he plugged my channel last night, and um, I couldn't be more appreciative. I had like 30 subscribers throughout the night from uh, his fan base coming over to mine. I hope it continues. The, his Survival Living fans and subscribers, you guys that came over to support me, thank you. Um, I hope to not let you down. I'm going to keep doing uh, videos. I'm almost, you know, I said in the previous video that I was going to wait until my Pathfinder adventures were over. But um, I think that's a cop out. I think I can find time for some small videos here and there, especially if people want to see me make some. So I'm going to do that. Again, thank you, Joe. And for the record, all of Survival Living's fans, in case you ever wondered, I trained right next to that man at the Pathfinder Pioneer Scout course, and uh, your boy's legit. He's legit. So definitely stick with his channel. Definitely keep following. He said he's going to be doing more wilderness, outdoor living stuff. I'm super stoked for that. Uh, he was an awesome guy to train next to, and, uh, and yeah, just thanks, guys. I appreciate it. Okay. So... Pathfinder Pioneer Scout Intermediate Course. Not easy. Not the most impossible thing in the world, but not easy. Um, I'm not going to get into a whole lot as far as what went on in the course. The instructors there, there's a lot of information that's been floating around out on the internet now. Uh, about what goes on at the Pathfinder School and one of the things that they do particularly for these patching courses is They they throw a bunch of curveballs at you and there's a lot of surprises And it's kind of hard to do that when everybody's sharing their experiences to the letter now Our boy Joe at survival living He just did a video of his experiences at the Pathfinder School and kind of gave a rundown of the class and what we went through he sent that video to the instructors. They approved it for release. So if you want to know more specifics as to what happened, 
I will put a link down in the description below to his channel, Survival Living, and that particular video, and you can check him out, and he gave you more specifics that were actually approved by the instructors at the school. I will just share some of what I experienced um, and some of what you'll probably experience should you decide to uh, attend one of these classes. And um, then I'm going to give six tips um, that I believe will help you be successful or, or at least make it towards the end of the course. Okay, so stick around for that. Also, as a side note, I want to throw it out there that I will be promoting Self-Reliance Outfitters and the Pathfinder School and all the instructors and their YouTube channels on my YouTube channel. I will be promoting them. No, they did not ask me to do it. No, I do not work for them. But I do believe in them. I believe in the school. I love the school. And I think people, I, I think it deserves more than it already has. And it's on the rise. Believe me, it's on the rise. But I'd like to see it peak. I'd like to see it elevate. Um, like I said, I love the school, so I'm going to be promoting their stuff. Okay. So this isn't part of the six tips that I was going to give you, but it is a tip that I'm going to give you right off the bat. Um, if you're going to attend, well, let's back up guys. The basic course the intermediate course and the advanced courses are all qualification courses. That means if you show up to one of those courses, they are going to expect that you are looking to get a certification, a patch, or a credential of some sort in that genre of survival and wilderness living. Everything they teach in these courses, they teach in other classes in a less stressful environment without the testing and without the rigors, but in a more relaxed environment and a more learning friendly environment. If you do not want to be tested and you do not want to be exerted and you do not want to be pushed, go to the other courses. Check out, I'll put a link in the description, check out Self-Reliance Outfitters and all the courses they offer. I think there's been a bit of confusion about these courses and the methodology behind them. And I think some people aren't understanding that the school offers education only courses that don't come with the rigors of a patching course. So just wanted to throw that out there. Now, if you are looking to come to one of those courses, whether it's basic, intermediate, or advanced, which I have yet to do, I have done the basic, patched, I've done the intermediate, and I patched alongside Survival Living. Advanced is coming up in a month. If you decide to do those, one of the first pieces of advice I'm going to offer you is when you go to gear dump and those instructors start telling you to put this in your truck, put that in your truck, put your expectations in the truck with everything else. They're going to throw curveballs at you. And if you go into these courses with an expectation of how things are going to go, how they're supposed to go, how you want them to go, you're going to set yourself at a psychological disadvantage right out the gate, okay? So as soon as you get to these courses, before you get there, have it in your head already that you're not going to have a whole lot of expectation about what you're going to go through. You're just going to take it as it comes, and you're going to do your best. So this Pioneer Scout course was a pretty tough one. Um, it's very physically exhausting. You will lose sleep probably will lose weight. I don't know what it's like what it's going to be like at other courses. Water. We had water. Um we had long hikes with only a 32 ounce bottle of water. So during those hikes with all the exertion you're probably going to get dehydrated, but we did have water available to us. Food not so much and there was a pretty significant lack of sleep. I lost 8 pounds over the whole course. And I'm, I only slept a whole collective of about six hours over the, over, the, over the whole course. So it was pretty grueling. Have your mind made up before you come to these courses that it's going to suck a little bit. And that's just the way it is. You're going to lose sleep. You're going to be hungry. And you're going to get really tired. On top of that, if you have addictions like caffeine, nicotine, 
you might be out of luck. I know at my course they allowed people to have cigarettes, but you couldn't light them unless you got your first Bogeville fire. I am a huge coffee drinker, and right at Gear Dump they said put your coffee away. That was a bit of a blow to me. <laughs> I dealt with it, um, but I had I had the caffeine headaches. I was definitely feeling the withdrawals on day two. Um, so again, you know, just embrace the idea that there's going to be some suffering. And, and try to go into it with the mindset of you kind of want to. You want to suffer because you want to see just how tough you really are. So along those lines, aside from what they're teaching at the Pathfinder School in terms of survival skills um, and navigation and all the other things that come with it, one thing I've really taken away from this school and the teachers is that they're kind of teaching a philosophy. They might not write it on the website, they might not come right out and say it, but they are. They're teaching a philosophy there, um, in these patching courses, uh, particularly. There's a lot of it that is um, <clears throat> geared towards improving your mentality on things and testing your mentality on things so that you can experience how far you can go. I know now that I can operate three to three and a half days without food and hike a bunch and that I will be okay. It doesn't feel good, but I can do it. I know that now. I didn't know that before. That is huge. That makes me way more confident going into advanced. Lesson learned there. I know that I can operate on minimal sleep if I really have to. Doesn't feel good, but I can do it. I know that now. I know that I can just stop drinking coffee for four days and also operate and it won't affect me as much as I thought. I know that when I am pushed to my absolute limit that I still have the ability to keep going. That's an invaluable lesson to learn. You can't put a price on that, in my opinion. You can put a price on teaching someone how to start a fire you can put a price on teaching someone how to navigate, but you can't put a price on teaching somebody about themselves and teaching them, allowing them, providing them uh, an arena to be tested in which they're going to figure out what they are actually capable of. That is an invaluable lesson to have and one of the reasons why I really believe in this school and, and honestly, I'm just, I'm in love with this school and its training principles. That's why they teach the way they do there, is for you to experience that. Now, one of the important things about this methodology is it also really highlights your weaknesses. And it also highlights your strengths. It's the same thing in kickboxing and fighting. We drive students to the point of sheer exhaustion. And then at that point, you can, you can see which things they have ingrained in their DNA and which things they have to think about in order to perform. Because when they're completely exhausted, they're no longer thinking clearly. And when they're not thinking clearly, things start to break down. And you then can see, okay, they don't have that technique down unless they're thinking about it. So they can't do it when they're tired. But they can do it when they're not. It's the same thing in survival. Um... You can probably accomplish most things with a fresh mind, a uh, full belly, and a full night's sleep. Take away the food, take away the sleep, take away the comforts, and drive a person for three days, and then see what they can do, and you're going to find out real quick where their skills actually lie and where their weaknesses lie. For me, it was navigation. I'm pretty good at firecraft. I'm pretty confident in those areas. I'm pretty good in a lot of bushcrafty things. My buck saw builds and my pack frame builds and those things, I'm pretty good at. Navigation, I fell a little bit short. It was the hardest thing for me to grasp. Now, I know navigation with it. I mean, I understand how to, how to navigate. I know how to use a compass. But the act of map reading and route planning and counting your pace for, for miles at a time to find a marker and recording all your azimuths to come back and make a pall map, that proved to be difficult for me when I was tired and exhausted and stressed. 
and that also was a great lesson for me to learn. Guess what I've been practicing a ton of since I got home? Got it. Navigation. So that's one reason why the instructors impose this much stress and deprivation on people in these classes. It's a, it's a lesson of self, but it also highlights your weaknesses, and then you can find out where it is you need to improve. Okay, so I told you I wasn't going to go into a lot of the specifics about the class, and I'm going to hold true to that. There are a lot of videos out there that will tell you those things. And like I said, Joe at Survival Living, he's got a good video that, that kind of goes more in depth as to what went on, and he's got pictures, and I'm in some of them, and he's in them. And uh, so I'm going to leave that to other people. But I do want to give you some tips, six tips that will help you make it to the end, I hope, and hopefully get that patch. Okay, so tip number one. And this is an important one. You must be physically fit. You have to be physically fit, at least to some degree. If you're out hiking with a pack on and you think it's enough, it's probably not. And I'm not saying that to be mean. I'm just saying that because I was hiking up to 20 miles with 50 pounds on my back. And I still got tired. Um, there were some guys there that were definitely struggle, struggling with that. And they weren't even really out of shape. Um, you don't have to be an Odonis. You don't have to be an extreme athlete. Okay. But you do need to be fit. You need to take that seriously. Basic class, you can get away with a little bit. Once you hit the uh, Pioneer Scout courses to advanced, you have to take physical fitness very seriously. So... That's tip number one. Get physically fit. Tip number two. Mentality. You need to have a strong mind going into this. Now, I struggle. I can be a bit emotional sometimes and I get emotional at these courses. I had some mantras and some ways of thinking that I used as anchor points for me while I was going through the course and while I had some low points that helped pull me out of those low points and push forward and get to the end of that class. So one of the first things I did to maintain mental sharpness or mental toughness is I went into it and telling myself, I'm just going to do one task at a time. If you look at the whole pie and think about trying to consume the whole pie all at once, it's going to seem daunting. But if you take it one slice at a time, eventually You've eaten the whole pie. That's a bit of a lame analogy. But if you look at the whole course on Thursday morning and all you think is, I can't wait for Sunday, you might be giving yourself a little bit more of a hard time than you need because Sunday is three days away and today it's Thursday and today you got a lot of work to do. So only focus on Thursday and only focus on one task at a time. If you start your day on a resource hike, that task is resources. Don't think of anything else. If you go to make a buck saw, your task is the buck saw. Give it your all. Don't think about Sunday. Don't think about your bow drill fire yet. Work on your buck saw. When it's over, move on. One task at a time. Break the weekend down into segments. Compartmentalize the weekend. And you will find that after one task, goes by and another goes by and another goes by, the day's over. And now you can sleep. Probably not a lot, but you can sleep and do it again. The same strategy throughout the entire course. That's what I did. One task at a time, and it saw me through to Sunday, which leads me to my next point. And I'm going to steal a quote from Jax Janiga, um, who is also a student and a, a person who patched at the Pioneer Scout class. Sunday will come. There will probably be moments where you're going to really feel like this sucks and I'm really tired and I'm really hungry and I can't wait for this to be over. Those moments will probably occur. Just remember, Sunday's going to come. Okay? It's just three days. You can do anything for three days. It's just three days. Three days compared to the span of your life is nothing. It's very small. And for me, I don't know about you guys, but I ain't got a lot of money. And these courses, 
they're some of the cheaper courses you're going to find out there, but they cost money. So $500 for a course. And I think to myself, how many trips to Waldemere would $500 buy my daughter that I'm about to waste if I quit? Okay? It's just three days. Make it the three days. Sunday will come. My last tip on mental toughness here is, and it's a mantra that I kept repeating to myself, is that nothing is over until it's actually over. It is very, very easy to feel defeated when you haven't eaten, you haven't slept, you've hiked a lot, carrying loads of weight, you're very tired, and then you just bombed your first nap course. It is very, very easy to feel like you're going to screw up the rest of the weekend. I kept telling myself, nothing is over until it's over, right? That applies to each individual task, and that applies to the weekend as a whole. You might not get everything right. In fact, you probably won't. But you can still patch if you get enough right and if you can turn things around. Okay, so even if you fail a few things and you're tired and you're upset and you're disappointed in yourself, nothing is over until it's actually over. All right, you give it your all until the instructors tell you to stop. And then you can find out what your results are. But until that point, it's not over until it's over. Okay, guys, so we covered be physically fit, work on mental toughness, develop some strategies that'll become anchor points for you while you're going through the course that you can call upon to keep you rooted in the moment and keep you staying there. Now we're going to move on to tip number three. And this is an important one and maybe overlooked one. Feet. You need to take care of your feet. We had a guy at our course who actually got trench foot, or at least the beginnings of it, and it was pretty nasty. Um, And he could not continue. And it wasn't really a choice of his. The instructors wouldn't let him continue because it was dangerous. So keep that in mind. You might be tough as nails, but if you're not taking care of your feet and your feet can't carry you, it might not matter how tough you are. You just dropped out because because now you're a risk, you're a liability, and you're a danger to yourself. You might seriously injure your foot. Um, you need to keep your feet dry. I recommend, they, they do allow, at least they did for our class, I recommend a change of socks. And um, the instructors recommend this, and I highly recommend it as well. Do not wear waterproof boots, okay? As Dave Canterbury says, waterproof boots are only as waterproof as they are high. After that, they become water buckets. You cannot get water out of them. Uh, Some people were joking with me because I wore a pair of Skechers to the course. I'm not advocating to wear Skechers to a survival course, okay? Might not be a good idea. But what I will say is I've hiked a lot in those shoes. I've been in rough terrain in those shoes. I knew that they served me well. They don't get wet too easily, but they dry very quickly. I also knew that. And my feet were perfectly fine by the end of the course. And I got soaked. I was able to dry them out every single night. I was able to dry them out in between hikes. Um, I looked after my feet. So did other people. And those that did were able to continue on and had very little problems uh, foot-wise, okay? Your feet are your wheels, and you're going to be doing a lot of navigating. So take care of your feet, all right? If you don't take care of your feet, you're not going to make it. All right, so tip number four, navigation. I highly recommend putting in some good study to navigation. Our course had a lot of navigation to it, map reading and finding waypoints kilometers apart and planning routes in accordance to a map. Uh, I had been slightly, I I was slightly familiarized with this, but um, I'm not satisfied with how little I knew going into the course. Now, yes, this is a course where they teach you navigation, but again, you're being graded and tested at these courses. So, you, the teaching happens at blinding speed, and you better pick it up. They have another course, Navigation Intensive, that they offer, which uh, I would highly recommend to take before taking these courses. I wish I had, and I didn't. So, you need to study navigation. All right, I highly recommend 
putting some good time in to understanding and comprehending that, it'll help you out a lot when you go to these courses. It's something I wish I did, and it's just what I recommend you do before you go. Tip number five, take the classes in succession, okay? They have guys that turn up to these classes that have never taken a basic class, and then they come to an intermediate class, and they're a little lost right out the gate. And this is not a class that you want to start off being lost at. Um, I, my first partner, and God bless him, he was an awesome guy, but he, when we, he hadn't taken his basic prior, and on our first nav course, he, uh, he said he was familiar with navigation from the military, which I'm sure he was, but he wasn't familiar with the uh, Sunto MC2 compass, and he didn't quite understand how it worked, and we were already on our first graded course, um, so that became a bit of a challenge. Uh, he, I showed him how it works. He picked things up fine. And then our first nav course, I messed up. Um, he did not mess up. So I taught him how to use the compass. I taught him how to navigate the way that they want to navigate. And then I screwed it up. So, you know, whatever. But um, these courses are meant to build on one another. And when you go into an intermediate course for the Pathfinder School, they are going to assume that you have knowledge of everything they taught in the basic course. And they're not going to really take the time to show you it. So you better either know it or hope that one of the students will show you because they have a large curriculum they're trying to trying to run and they don't have time to backtrack, okay? They're moving forward in these courses. So take the courses in succession. On that note, I also highly recommend to take Bushcraft 101 and navigation intensive before these courses. Both those courses will help you greatly with your builds and your navigation and, and help you with your success in the intermediate Pioneer Scout course. So Bushcraft 101, navigation intensive, basic class. At least basic. At least please take basic before intermediate. Okay? Tip number six. And this is an important one. Be prepared before you even show up to the course. There are guys that I've seen at basic, my basic, my brother's basic, even Bushcraft 101, but I suppose that's not as important, and at my intermediate, that right at gear dump, they didn't have the things they were supposed to have. You know, when they say that you need a carbon steel knife with a 90 degree spine, they say that because the things they're going to be teaching you requires that. And the things that they're going to be testing you on also require that. If you did not show up to the course with what was on the gear list and with the specifics that they put on there, you might already be dropping deliverables before you've even, before you've even started. And that, that's really unfortunate. Um, not to be harsh... I don't believe that the that the instructors count it against you if you show up and you don't have the proper stuff be, because you didn't read the gear list. Um, I don't believe they do that. In my opinion, that's a little bit of mercy on their end. I, in my opinion, not to be harsh, that should be a deliverable all of its own. Just because part of the, if, I mean, if you show up to these courses, it's, it's, um, expected that you want a certification, you know that you're being tested. So part of, be of being a self-reliant individual capable of survival in the wild is preparation, right? You want to be somebody that becomes, that is prepared before ever getting into a situation, all right? You demonstrate that also right at gear dump at this school. Just go ahead, do yourself a favor, study the gear list, study the curriculum best you can, but again, leave the expectations in the car, but study the gear list and show these guys that you did your homework. Show up with the right stuff. Trust me, guys, I'm not trying to be harsh, but you do not want to start this course right at gear dump, feeling like crap about yourself because you have to borrow something or... You feel like you look like a fool because you didn't bring something you should have had. Or, worst case scenario, you don't even have the thing and you already know you're going to fail some deliverables. You don't want to start that way. Study the list. Show up prepared.
All right, guys, so those were my six tips, all right? Be physically fit, find anchor points in terms of mental toughness that'll help you get through the course, take care of your feet, work on your navigation, and yes, I'm reading from a list. Uh, take the classes in succession and be prepared before you even arrive. I hope this video helps you guys, and uh, I appreciate all of you. I will try to put out videos at least once every couple of weeks now, even as, if it's just short tutorials. Um, again, thank you, Joe, at Survival Living. I really appreciate the shout out. And, uh, and yeah, guys, just thanks for sticking with me, and um, I'll see you in the next one. Thanks a lot.